So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but uh, hopefully complement uh, what you've been hearing. Um, and there are some, after all, some common themes. And I am going to bring in the issue of uh, aging, which I, as I did my looking around the audience, I realized that there are about uh, uh, 14 people over the age of 50 that will come relevant in a few minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about, um, about hematopoiesis, another uh, stem cell type, and talk about the uh, oddities, if you will, of um, stem cell longevity and cell cycle. Talk about the importance of genomic stability and, and uh, uh, DNA repair uh, in stem cells. And then get into some, I'm sorry, I'm going to do some little bit of uh, model building with you. And then two experimental systems. One is uh, in mismatch repair and the other in uh, non-homologous end joining. So um, it's unusual for me to give a talk at the end of the day and not have had someone already talk about hematopoiesis. So your blood, uh, which is uh, are these cells out here all come from uh, well-characterized progenitors in, a, in an, a set of relatively small number, about 30 or 40,000 um, hematopoietic stem cells, so-called long-term and short-term uh, repopulating cells. And we all, if we're lucky, live to our 80s or 90s with um, offspring of these uh, 30,000 cells. So they're pretty important. And they're nestled in uh, to two places in the marrow. One's called the endosteal niche, and the other's called the, the perivascular niche. So the endosteal niche is simply the marrow space up along the bone. And it's the space between macrophages and uh, osteal cells, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, mesenchymal stem cells, something that's been well studied at this institution. And the, the more dormant uh, hematopoietic stem cell or quiescent cell is, is nestled in um, carefully listening to signals but not responding very much. And it is quite quiescent in so doing. And then it will migrate uh, over towards a vascular niche with a different set of cells, including the uh, a, a sort of a pericyte um, of um, mesenchymal stem cells, other macrophages, endothelial cells, and the like. And then as it divides, one, one copy, to one cell product often enters into a sinusoid, into a blood vessel that's floating off, and the other returns back uh, toward dormant uh, space. So this is just another um, <coughs> um, uh, recent review article on the topic, just to point out the complexity of signaling that takes place as cells move from the quiescent to the, to the uh, activated uh, state. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time thinking about with you the importance of this resting quiescent G0 space. Uh, Tony just talked about um, uh, pluripotent, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Many of the other classifications of stem cells sort of forget about the importance of this quiescent state. But if you've only got 30,000 hematopoietic stem cells, most of them better be quiescent, and most of them better be in this quiescent space along the sinusoid. Uh, I'm sorry, along the uh, osteal surface because you need to call on them. And it's thought that these cells will individually divide maybe once every month or two months. Uh, so they're almost always sitting quiescent, tucked into a niche when they're very hard to move away from that niche. There's two points that I want to make about these processes that go haywire. One is we get old. As we get old, um, uh, we have fewer of those 30,000 cells. And so a, a greater proportion as opposed to young folks, including those in the audience. And this has been studied both in animals and humans. Um, so as, as you go from the to, um, young age to older age, and this break point, as I'll show you, we think happens around the age of 50, um, more cells are cycling, um, fewer in the G0 state, uh, and you're replenishing these cells um, um, more often, both because of chronic inflammation, utilization, and uh, the emergence of deficiencies in immune systems so that you have to sort of pr propagate more of these cells, whereas in the young age, you've got a, a very robust immune system. These cells take care of themselves in the thymus and the marrow uh, where they're expanding. And, and, and older adults, the T cell and B cell progeny don't have such a long life, and so you've got to replenish them much more actively. So you have a tendency to move from the G0 
uh, into the cell cycle. <laughs> so there are other things that sort of knock off our stem cells, whether it be reactive oxygen species, uh, in endogenous or exogenous forms of damage. Uh, chronic inflammation is certainly uh, critical. We know repeated infection, um, immune responses of a whole variety of types, uh, regeneration processes that take place of the endothelium from cardiovascular disease and the like. Um, and there are very clear methodologies to sort of uh, self-regulate this, including uh, DNA uh, repair mechanisms, which is what I want to talk about a little bit more. So um, it's been easy to study the exogenous damage where radiation exposure, chemical mutagens, but the intrinsic damage is probably just as important and probably more important uh, over time, um, especially in the context of aging. So we know there are some defects that can emerge in these processes. And I'll just take you through one simple example, and that is of the, of the telomere um, um, complex. And we know that telomere is important for cell replication, not so much for quiescence, but certainly for replication. And we know that there's a whole variety of genes uh, involved in, in telomere uh, maintenance. And in fact, if those are mutant or acquired mutant, uh, then um, that gives rise to a hematopoietic condition known as aplastic anemia. So this is a marrow um, aspirate from any one of us, but it, it has hardly any cells in it. So you see uh, stroma and, and fibrous material, red cells, but you see very few cells. This should be absolutely packed with uh, cell products. And so this is a, simply a consequence of telomere shortening. And we're able to document that many individuals who develop aplastic anemia have remarkably short telomeres as if they had um, undergone this process and every cycle without um, uh, telomere maintenance had lost telomeres and then were just unable to uh, replicate. So that's certainly one well-appreciated form of disorders. And I'm going to talk about uh, two others in the, in the uh, DNA repair uh, pathways. Um, one is um, mismatch repair studies that we've done, and the other is double-strand break repair uh, with a non-homologous uh, end joint. So let me just take you through some studies with uh, mismatch repair that we've done. So mismatch repair is critical during uh, replication. If there's a synthesis mistake and you make a mistake here, uh, you've got to recognize it. Um, uh, uh, cut back to a single strand, re-replicate, um, and then uh, repair. And that normally happens uh, very efficiently. If you don't do it, however, um, if you can't recognize the single or the double base lesion, then you develop a microsatellites over time. And so it's easy to mark cells that have mismatch repair deficiency by the development of microsatellites. Um, but of course, you've got to be able to see the, a clone of cells that are progeny. So it's, it was obvious to us that if we asked about hematopoietic stem cells, that would give us our clonal population. So we did some simple experiments early on <laughs> that actually had some relatively profound results. So you can knock out uh, mismatch repair genes. We knocked out MSH2. Uh, in mice, and the mice are okay. They develop uh, lymphoma at about 8 to 12 months of life. But if you take them early on at uh, 8 to 12 weeks, uh, you can um, uh, stem cell transplant them. And you've all heard of stem cell transplantation. You lethally irradiate, in this case, a recipient mouse. Uh, and we did a, a, a modification of the normal method, which is instead of just transplanting in either wild type or mismatch repair defective cells into this mouse, we mix them one to one so that we can ask, well, who wins? Who, who's, a better, who's better able to reconstitute the marrow? And we did that not just once, but we did it uh, three times. And over time, uh, we found that we started to lose and then completely lost the mismatch repair defective cells. So they were just unable to repopulate. So, we weren't quite sure how to interpret this result early on, and I'm not going to go into details on it, but suffice it to say, we were able to pluck uh, individual stem cells from uh, culture dishes after the transplant. And we found that during the second um, passage, the, re the recipients, uh, sorry, the, the donors from this first uh, transplant passage that went into the second transplant recipient 
started to show evidence that almost all the clones had microsatellites. So these cells, which had been looked normal and were able to reconstitute early on, uh, by the time they got to the second or third generation of transplantation, they had been stressed enough that clones now, these are normal clones, showed evidence of microsatellite instability, which is the sequela we'd expect after a number of rounds of replication. So remember, these are resting quiescent cells. So if you look at them de novo, it's hard to find a microsatellite. But if you force them to replicate and replicate and replicate by a reconstitution experiment, the first thing that happens is they develop microsatellite, and the second thing that happens is they disappear uh, from the recipient mouse because they can't maintain uh, a quiescent uh, state. So we asked, does this happen in humans? So uh, we've been, for years, been collecting uh, marrow uh, from a variety of either normal donors or people having a hip or knee replacement. It's relatively easy to grow those cells in culture. And then we plucked individual colonies, which are the progeny of hematopoietic stem cells, and asked, do they have evidence of microsatellite instability? And um, to our surprise, <coughs> we found that there was a, a cluster of individuals, almost all over the age of 50, um, in which you could now find up to half of the hematopoietic stem cell clones showed evidence that two of five uh, sites that are typically used for other diagnostics for uh, microsatellite instability showed evidence of microsatellite instability. And we just didn't see it. We saw it randomly. Um, at younger ages, and we even found it in some individuals at the time of their cord blood collection. So this turns out to be um, about 20% uh, of the population. Uh, we went on to look more carefully uh, and sequenced the promoter region of the mismatch repair uh, genes and found that one uh, gene, MLH1, which is known to be involved in the syndrome of non-polyposis colon cancer, where it's an inherited disorder, uh, is um, uh, hypermethylated in the, at the distal region, uh, much more frequently in the clones of cells that didn't express MLH1, so linking hypermethylation to loss of expression of MLH1, and then secondarily to evidence of microsatellite instability. So it provides us with a clear mechanism for acquired loss of DNA repair linked uh, to a function in humans, uh, at least uh, to a function of, um, of uh, microsatellite instability. Now, I'll remind you <laughs> that there are two, two competing events that happen in the mice, and we haven't yet proved this in humans. We know that in the mice, if we force their clonal evolution, that we'll start to see microsatellite instability, but they're also lost. So it's not good to have microsatellite instability if you're a stem cell and you tend to get lost. But we also know in the mouse that those mice go on to develop a T cell lymphoma. We've done experiments where we can now take and extract out a single stem cell, repopulate a mouse with a single stem cell, and every single one of those mice reconstitutes their marrow and goes on to develop a leukemia. So we can show that, in fact, the ability for a stem cell to have microsatellite instability is both leukemogenic and leads to loss of stem cell function. So that's one interesting model, um, which I've just summarized here, um, that one can develop both marrow failure and then leukemogenesis based on loss of, of mismatch repair. So the second uh, equally interesting model to us is um, that of uh, double-strand break repair. and uh, Again, of interest to the, this, to the presentations we've heard early this evening is really the dichotomy that we found to be remarkably um, not overlapping of the G0 state versus the uh, G2S uh, state of non homologous end joining versus homologous recombination, uh, double strand break repair. Now, it's often thought that these are interchangeable, but if you have a real resting population and there's no complementary strand, then you really can't use homologous recombination. So what happens in the stem cell pool if you now have a loss of non-homologous end joining? And what we found, and I'll show you the data for this, is that that resting population gets out of G0, goes to G1, G2, uh, uses homologous recombination to fix breaks, and then stays in a replicative mode and, and ends up with a loss of the G0 population. So let me show you that data. <laughs> so we asked the question, does loss of double-strand break repair by a non-homologous uh, 
uh, by the loss of function of non-homologous end jointing effect hematopoietic stem cell maintenance and longevity. And the model we used was the Q70 knockout uh, mouse. So we did the experiment just like I showed you with mismatch repair, and we mixed one to one either wild type or Q70 knockout cells, put those into a lethally irradiated recipient and ask who in grafts. <laughs> and although these are a little bit complicated to look at in detail because of the use of a marker which is on one but not both of the wild type and mutant donors, uh, if we um, mix Q70 with wild type, the only thing that in grafts are the wild type cells. So that's shown here, and all you get is wild type cells repopulating, as if uh, the wild type either out, somehow outcompeted or lodged and home better uh, than the Q70 knockout cells. So we asked whether this was due to, as we had hypothesized, loss of the G0 population with the understanding that it is a G0 cell that is required to stay in the niche over a long period of time. And I, I didn't pay attention to the fact that we didn't analyze this for a full eight to 16 weeks. So we looked at the bone marrows 16 weeks later after, after everything had returned to homeostasis. And by that time, there had been complete loss of the Q70 cell population. So to understand that a little bit better, <laughs> we asked, well, can we, can we bump cells out of a niche if they're in G0? And can we bump cells out of the niche if they're not in G0? So for this experiment, uh, we transplanted either Q70 cells or wild type cells into a dual lethally irradiated recipient. Without competition, the Q70 cells will transplant. The mice are fine at eight weeks. And then we infused GFP wild type um, mouse cells and asked, can we repopulate the mouse without additional recondition reconditioning uh, with the GFP positive cells? So with wild type cells, uh, all of you wouldn't like it if when you got a blood transfusion for whatever reason, you sudden ha somehow suddenly got a transplant and that doesn't happen because your stem cells are sitting in the niche quiescent and incoming stem cells, rare or frequent, can't get into the niche. And so in fact, um, uh, we know at any species that our own stem cells are able to maintain their niche and can't be bumped out by new incoming cells unless, unless we irradiate or do some other drastic means to get rid of the cells. And our prediction was that with Q70 knockout cells in this setting, that in fact those cells would be floating out of the niche, we hypothesized undergoing homologous recombination, um, and be susceptible to being bumped out. And that data is shown here, um, where if we put in wild type cells, and again, we are able to look for GFP cells. So if we, if we transplant into the wild type, um, uh, if we tra transplant um, into a wild type mouse, GFP cells, we can't see any repopulation. It's a little less than 1%. But in the Q70 mouse, you can see almost full reconstitution with GFP positive cells. So here's the percentage of of the hematopoietic cells and percentage of stem cells uh, that are recovered from the bone marrow. So it looks to us like loss of G0, loss of non-homologous end joining results in reconstitution capacity uh, with wild type cells. So <clears throat> if we were correct that there was a loss of G0 and the cells were instead using homologous recombination uh, to stay alive, were then not robust hematopoietic stem cells, can we separate out those two functions? So we introduced into the Q70 knockout mouse BCL2. And one of the not well appreciated phenomena of BCL2 is encourage cells to slow down in the cell cycle and get back into a G0 state. Now we haven't fixed in the uh, Q70 knockout BCL2 mouse the DNA repair capacity. We've just allowed them to, to go back into a G0 state. So those experiments are shown here. <laughs> so here is um, um, a set of transplantations, either wild type um, um, BCL2, Q70 um, animals or uh, mixtures uh, of, uh, of, of a double uh, transgenic. And we're looking at the level of stem cell populations. And you can see that they're 
uh, the wild type in 70, Q70 have similar numbers of stem cells if we just look at the total bone marrow. There's a slight increase in that number in the BCL2 transgenic and in the combination. If we look at the percentage of cells that are in G0, and I've been taking you through all of that data before because this is the more important data, uh, in wild type cells there's a about a third of the stem cell population is in G0. In Q70 knockout it's much lower, maybe half. It's higher in the transgenic and it's above normal uh, in the transgenic Q70 knockout. So we're able to restore G0 uh, in the Q70 uh, in the Q70, um, let me get this right, in the Q70 knockout. And if we look at proliferating cells, there's more proliferating cells in the Q70. Again, they've lost their G0 state, and that is returned back to normal uh, by BCL2. So does that have an effect on the ability to stem cell and graft? So I showed you data before that the Q70 knockout could be bumped out uh, by GFP uh, stem cells just as a surrogate for uh, observing stem cell populations and reconstitution in this transplantation experiment. So here again, wild type and, and, and BCL2 can't be over, over transplanted, if you will, by wild type cells, um, whereas Q70 can, and that loss of function of stem cells is restored uh, by um, BCL2 overexpression. So we've been able to conclude from that that um, even more important than the ability to repair DNA in stem cell populations is the ability to remain quiescent for extended periods of time. And loss of that function, loss of, of uh, double strand break repair capacity by loss of non-homologous end joining, which we assume is causing cells to become more active and using homologous recombination, results in loss of the ability to maintain this uh, stem cell population over extended periods of time. And simply restoring that with BCL2 overexpression, even though we have a fixed DNA repair, restores um, long-term hematopoietic function by restoring the quiescent uh, subpopulation of cells. So uh, I want to just point out my laboratory, some of whom are here, uh, and some of the, of the work of Alex Wang, uh, Wan Zhao, um, and Shigimi Matsuyama, as well as our ability to ask Attack Mac for the um, MSH2 mice and uh, Fred Alt for the Q70 knockout uh, mice. Uh, and most of the work um, here was done by uh, Yulan Sheng, um, who uh, I don't see in the audience, but did most of the work. Thank you. Yes. I'm missing a connection. The failure, so you have some kind of endogenous damage that you think is normally prepared by KU. But in the absence of KU, what drives the cells out of the cell sequence? Is there a loss of the checkpoint? I, mean, I, don't, I don't see the logic that says that they should leave the checkpoint, leave the G0 state simply because they have failed to repair. Well, you know, we haven't established that. Um, we know they're not in G0. But there's a real significant loss of the G0 state. Uh, where uh, there are data on <coughs> ROS and spontaneous um, strand breaks. So the cell has two options. It can die of a strand break or it can go into cell cycle. So we have data on loss of G0, entrance of cell cycle. We have other experiments where we've shown that if we lose homologous recombination, the cells are just fine until they're damaged and go into cycle, and then they lose the their, uh, their hematopoietic stem cell function. So we've got those two complementary pieces of information. I didn't show you that this evening. What the trigger is for the cell at a, at a strand break point to leave G0 and, and go into cycle, we're not sure. It's a good question. Is, is there an ATM connection? There, uh, there is, but we don't see anything unusual in signaling. So these are normal processes of inducing uh, cell proliferation. So we don't think that's defective at all. It's just the inability to repair in G0. So you, at the beginning, you talked about you know, a feedback mechanism for uh, adults where we're starting to see immune deficiencies and so we'll start, uh, Cells in the niche have to start doing the cycle. But then 
and delete who, aren't you going to affect T cell rearrangement, T cell receptor rearrangement and DDJ joining? Isn't that going to change your T and B cell population, mature populations in the circulation and feed back to the niche and varietals cycle? So, uh, so sure. So that's a good point that 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 um, non-homologous end-joint mice of any type, whether it be the skid or the coup uh, or the uh, DNAPK, are all unable to make T and B cells. So you're absolutely right. They do, however, make a common precursor T cell, and that precursor T cell just doesn't make progeny. So it's unclear whether the drive is at that precursor cell or back up to hematopoietic stem cells. It's a good question. Um, in the RAG1 uh, and RAG2 knockout mice, where they're also unable to do VDJ recombination but don't have a defect in strand break repair, their hematopoiesis is normal and they don't have a niche problem. So it's interesting that it really somehow relates to the double strand break repair aspect, not the loss of T and B cell function. So what do we know about the feedback to the niche from the circulation? So you know that that's dependent? Your, I couldn't figure no, out I don't, if the transplantation experiments ruled out a certain problem in the circulation dealing going back to the niche or whether it was a cell image that wasn't. That's a good question, and so I don't know the answer to that. Um, we do know all of the um, um, signals that are niche, you know, occupancy maintenance signals, um, and a couple of those are quite abnormal in um, uh, the knockout, the, the non-homologous engineering knockout mice. So they have very high levels of MIPL and other things which are pushing cells into cycle. So they are getting a signal to push into cycle. So whether that's coming from the niche itself or coming from a circulation feedback is a good question. I said a yeast observation that may be useful. Who, who minus yeast cells in G1 arrested cells? Uh, G1 arrested cells with a double strand break don't dissect the broken ends because of the failure to activate CK and other mm -hmm. processes. But Q minus cells do activate ATM or ATR because uh, it allows one of the two exonucleases, XO1, to create significant degradation of broken ends even though the cells are arrested in G1. And so it is, it, it's an interesting possibility that the Q the absence of Q is actually allowing the initial processing of breaks that would drive them towards homologous recombination. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we've, we've also happened to look at, at X01 knockout mice, and they look perfectly normal until you do what we found to be a really intriguing experiment. If we radiate the mice, they recover into fine. If we 5-FU treat the mice, which causes um, proliferating cells to be knocked off, and so the, the re resting cells go actively in the cycle. Nothing happens. If we give 5-FU and four days later give radiation, the X01 mice all die. So presumably they're being pushed into cell cycle, but homologous recombination doesn't work. If they're resting, they can use non-homologous end joint. So it's the complement of what you've just described. So, thank you.